Welcome to all of our alumni joining us. My name is Greg Leparati. I'm Associate Director of Alumni Relations here at Baruch. Pleasure to have you all here with us this evening. I am uh, Zooming from Queens. Uh, feel free to put in the chat where you're Zooming from. It's kind of rainy here this evening, so not the greatest night. Uh, good night to be on a webinar. So uh, glad to have you all here with us. Um, looking forward to today's topic. Uh, love these different uh, topics that we cover with Alan Chen about financial literacy. Today's lessons from an economic recession. I know Alan and I both remember the last economic recession we had, and uh, we may be in one now as well. So I'm sure we'll have a lot of good discussion going on uh, throughout today's presentation. A few quick ground rules. Uh, please mute your microphones. You can turn your cameras on. In fact, I encourage it. Great to see uh, an audience looking back at us. Um, but uh, please do mute your microphones in case there are any ambient noises that distract us. Uh, direct all of your questions to the chat throughout this uh, presentation. Alan will get to them throughout. And if there's anything we don't cover, we will have time at the end to go over any remaining questions that weren't answered previously. So be ready for that. Uh, and then a, a one big reminder, we will be distributing this recording uh, after the event. So don't worry if you miss anything, we will send this out so you'll be able to go back and check it out. Uh, now just a bit about our speaker, Alan Shen. I'll keep this very brief. Uh, Alan is a Baruch graduate and uh, you would think after graduating uh, from a great business school like Baruch, he would know how to manage his personal finances. but. Turns out he found out that you know financial literacy is not something taught in schools really. And so he went about correcting that by becoming something of an armchair expert on it. Uh, so Alan now wants to share a lot of that knowledge with fellow Baruch alumni. And we're grateful that he's here to be doing these, uh, these webinars for us. Uh, always great to have Alan here. Uh, by day, he works as a software lead at Rent the Runway. By night, he studies financial literacy and makes YouTube videos. I highly encourage you to subscribe to his channel. And uh, without further ado, I, I uh, present Alan Chen. Take it away, Alan. Thank you, Greg. Always appreciate that introduction. Um, so today we're gonna to be talking about economic recessions. Uh, hopefully folks who've been to some of my financial literacy workshops. If not, you know, it's your first time, welcome. Always happy to have new folks join. And we do these roughly every month or so. Um, during the year. I'm excited to present today on the topic of economic recession. Very curious, um, is anyone here, did anyone graduate from Baruch with an economics degree? Just out of curiosity, you can just tell me in the chat. Um, but for those of you who have, you'll have an upper hand in some of this data that we're looking at, and hopefully you can help some folks out as we interpret them and walk through them. All right, so before I dig deep into recessions, um, let's talk about a little bit about myself and um, you know where I'm coming from and how else everything ties into um, uh, my favorite reference for economics recessions. Um, so the big thing here is that, um, you know, personally, I come from a low income, not English not speaking immigrant uh, parents background. Um, so, you know, recession is the word that we're not familiar with. Uh, it's more of like, you know, you just kind of work, get your money, stash it in your, uh, you know, in your bed and buy a house, right? That's the idea of most uh, immigrants, right? Um, and a recession is something that's not really on top of mind until maybe someone loses a job, right? So that's something very important and it's sort of provide context um, for how I look at recessions and, um, you know, how I evolved from that mindset to a mindset that's more sustainable in terms of recessions and a best way or best path forward for uh, managing them. Um, so, you know, I firmly believe that everyone needs to, you know, have an opportunity to retire, right? And given where we are in America and given how wealth is um, more and more difficult to acquire every year, as we're seeing based on data and statistics, it's very important that we try to understand, you know, how we can generate wealth both generationally and make sure that, you know, by the time you're in your 60s, you have an opportunity to retire. And recessions play such a, a huge part in that because if you are 60 and then recession hits you, potentially you might not be able to retire. So it's important that we sort of um, understand where we're coming from. All right, so some other things to talk about here is that, you know, I graduated from Brooklyn in 2017. I've done 36 volunteer workshops and two paid um, with uh, other corporations. I'm happy to do paid if you want to reach out to it, uh, to me about them or volunteer, right? If you have organizations that you volunteer and are part of and you want me to participate in, happy to do so as well. 
Now, the last recession that we're in that Greg briefly mentioned was in 2020. Very brief, but very impactful because then the recession, I lost 31.81% of my, uh, my investments. Now, the term loss here is very uh, you know, sort of uh, transitive because I didn't actually lose that money. I just watched it decrease and rebound. Right? So the key point is that you don't sell, which I will dig into more and the reason for why I didn't sell those investments. Uh, but at one point in time, I was looking at a 31% loss. So basically, all the money I had, my net worth was cut by 31%, more or less. Right. So you lose a third of your wealth. Not great. Very difficult for folks. Uh, but also something that you know we'll work through and understand um, when it comes to recession. All right, so first things first, disclaimer, I am not a financial advisor, but the most important thing is I'm not your financial advisor. All right, so everyone's personal finances is going to be a little bit different. And right? how you approach recession is going to vary. And I'm going to talk about a very generic approach, but if you feel like you have a very specific situation, we can talk more about it, walk through it, and figure out you know, good battle plan when a recession does creep up on us. Uh, but, you know, please do your own comprehensive research, comprehensive research, especially since we are talking about investments. You know, you want to make sure that you are making the right financial decisions, whether you have to reach out to a financial advisor or not, right? If you want to do your own research, that's fine too. All right, so what is an economic recession? Um, I did ask in the chat if anyone would had an economics degree, but maybe none of us do, which is fine, right? <laughs> Uh, we'll talk through some of this high level, right? Very high level data, nothing too crazy and nothing we have to dig too deep into. So the economic recession, if you really think about it, is that, you know, when an economy or our economy, the U.S. economy shrinks for two quarters, right? Which translates to six months. Um, and usually it's declared by the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, and this is like a straightforward, but not straightforward, because generally speaking, news outlets, most folks look toward this metric of when the economy shrinks. But at the end of the day, the National Bureau of Economic Research makes the final call. Uh, so that's the key point here. Now, second thing is US economic recessions are cyclical. What I mean by that is that they happen and they're going to happen and they've always happened, right? They are on and off. And so we've had 48 recessions since the late 1700s. Um, we've recovered from all 48 and we might be heading into, we are always heading into recession because again, the economy is cyclical, right? So you can always expect a recession to, to creep up on you in the future. Now, the most famous indicator um, is the gross domestic, domestic product, which is GDP, right? Again, digging into some more of the economic terminology, but not too crazy. I'm sure most of you have heard this term at this point, uh, especially if you've been following the news. Uh, basically, it just measures the economic activity. Right. And you can read more about the GDP with that source below that I've linked. Uh, but just high level, we're going to go over a few of these key factors and just tie them into sort of policies that the government has implemented and just have us understand why it would lead to a recession when we see this metric go down. Right. So GDP is basically composed of four metrics. Right. So it's composed of consumption which is just like how it sounds like, you know, consumer spending. Are you spending money? The more money you spend is an indicator of economic growth. So the more you spend, the better it is for the economy. Doesn't necessarily mean it's better for you because if you plunge yourself into debt to spend money for the economy, not great, right? But it's a measurement for the country as a whole. Now, second thing here is government spending. Also, very straightforward. Right? Think of it as when the government spends money for big projects, big public projects, that creates jobs. If you create jobs, people have more money to spend. So the economy grows. All right. Third thing here is investments. Very similar to government spending, but think of it from the, from the perspective of private investments. All right. So if your company decides, hey, I'm gonna, we're going to hire more people. We're going to grow a new division. That's investing in the company. That means more jobs and more spending and so on. The last one here is net exports. It's straightforward, but also a little complicated because of the sense that it's basically the total exports that we're making to other countries needs to be greater than the total imports that we're importing from other countries, right? So basically we are selling more to other countries than we are buying from them, right? And that would be, that could be positive and that would impact our GDP as well. And all these factors play into if we see a recession or not, um, which we will, right? It's just a matter of when. All right. 
Off the terminology, now on to how recession can impact us. So there are a couple things here. Um, the ones that are probably most relevant to us uh, are these three. The idea of job security, stocks, and bonds. Right, job security, I think, is an obvious one. Uh, we've seen the headlines today, now, uh, especially if you are in the tech industry, we've seen that job security is in trouble right now. A lot, there's a lot of layoffs. Right, this may not be true across the board because if you've been following um, economic data that's been released in the past couple of days, we know that job growth has been very good, very well. You know, so it's kind of tricky for are we in a recession or not. Uh, but we still see a lot of headlines with layoffs, right? Especially if you're in tech. So that's the idea of job security. Usually a recession does lead to job loss and which we'll, we'll explore our data in a little bit as well. Stocks, bonds, there is correlation with recessions and how that impacts your investments, investments, especially if you have money in your 401k or just any other investments that you might be saving for. Chances are you're going to run into a couple of recessions before you get to retirement, for example. Uh, just because they, you know, generally speaking, they happen every five to 10 years, give or take, right? So there is going to be a couple there. We have a question in the chat. Is there a correction in the tech world with all the layoffs or why so many layoffs there if jobs continue to grow? It's a good question. Um, the theory that I've been hearing is that basically uh, tech is overvalued, Right. Um, we can go on and on about how, you know, tech has really high PE ratios, right? Basically, their expectations of growth are wildly, you know, uh, they don't really make sense long term and are unsustainable. Um, in that case, it would make sense if we have a downturn, people spend less money, that it would result in uh, layoffs in tech. Uh, but it doesn't, it also doesn't explain why there's no large layoffs in other industries right now. Um, one might say that tech is over leveraged, right? They just have a lot of borrowed money, right? Um, and a lot of investments. Uh, and when people are afraid of a recession coming, tech goes first. Uh, but there could be a lot of theories. I'm sure there will always be a lot of theories about it. But a correction, I think, would be the right word for it in terms of like why the correction is happening. Hard to say. I think it's really hard to say until post after the fact, right? Maybe a couple of months down the line when we look back on the data. All right, layoffs, a topic that we're all scared of, but tends to get us all the time, right? Eventually, folks experience a layoff throughout their lifetime just because recessions happen throughout their lifetime. So this data from the past 20 years, we've had two recessions in the past 20 years, in 07, 08 uh, for the housing crisis, and then in 2020 due to COVID, shutting down our economy, right? So those are the two huge recessions we've had. And you'll see in this chart that when we have a recession, which is shaded in the gray here, um, the, the rate for unemployment spikes, right? So for those of you who aren't aware, the unemployment rate basically states that these are the people who are looking for work, but haven't found work, right? So the higher it is, you know, the worse it is because that's more people looking for work that, hasn't, that haven't found work, right? So in 07, 08, the number reached around almost 10%, if not right on it. So that's 10% of people looking for work that haven't found work, right? That's a huge number um, and not great, right? So the government wants to keep this number as low as possible because it means that folks are, you know, are employed in a sense, um, or folks that need to be employed are employed. 2020, we saw another huge spike, uh, upwards of 14, right? 15%, pretty crazy. Uh, but what you'll notice is that every recession is different. Right. So we know recessions happen, but every recession is different. You'll notice how in the housing crisis, the unemployment rate steadily recovered over time, right? But for the pandemic, it just recovered almost right away, right? Um, compare when you compare it relatively, right? you'll see how there's a huge difference in how the unemployment reacts. But what we can say for sure is that when a recession happens, unemployment is going up. Right? You can think of like, in a sense that if a recession happens, it means that the U.S. economy is shrinking, right? There's less money going around. Uh, companies don't feel like there is uh, consumption, right? They're not selling enough. They're not making enough money. And if companies don't make enough money, they are looking to cut costs. And when they cut costs, that means you lose your job, right? Layoffs occur. 
uh, job positions are closed. And this is the reasoning for why a re when a recession happens, unemployment goes up. Uh, but I think one unique point to call out that was also, I mentioned briefly and also is brought up in the chat is that the overall unemployment rate is still relatively low, sitting below 4%, right? So there may be a recession coming up, but we're not seeing it in unemployment right now. All right, next up we have stocks. Uh, for those of you who held stocks during 08 and 2020, it was probably really tough uh, because the value of stocks dropped heavily um, during those times. Um, and remember, stocks are basically, um, when you own a stock, you own a portion of that company. So if the company is not doing well, it loses value. Um, and sometimes the failure of a company is isolated. But when we're, when we're talking about recession, the majority of U.S. companies will drop in value. There are a few key players who do well during a recession. Uh, most of the time, uh, companies do perform negatively, right? So you'll see a drop in your investments. You'll see a drop in value for all of that. In this case, we're talking about S&P 500. I also have the Dow here, but we can focus on S&P 500. Um, and for those of you who aren't aware, S&P 500 is basically, think of it like a measurement of the 500 largest companies in the U.S., and if it's doing well, stocks in generally generally are performing well. If S&P 500 is down, stocks aren't doing so well. Right? We can think about it like that. It's a little bit more complicated, but I think it's a good way to phrase it. And on this chart, you can see the shaded areas here. I think it's like the blue, kind of light purple. Those are recessions. And during those, you can see the lines, hey, they dip, right? Because that's where a stock market performs poorly when there's a recession. So it's expected that the recession will decrease the value of your investments, right? That's a given. We don't know when a recession happens. So you can't predict when your, you know, your stocks and your investments will decrease the value. What we can say is that historically speaking, those investments do recover, right? You see that a line tends to go back up after the purple has ended, right? Or that the dark blue, the light blue has ended. It goes back up and it continues to recover. Right. So generally speaking, historically speaking, over a 90 year period, the stock market, the US stock market trends upwards. Uh, but there are a few dips here and there to keep in mind of whenever a recession occurs. So it's now a good time to invest if you have the money. Now, I can't tell you what to do, right? Remember, I'm not a financial advisor, but personally, uh, I am continuing to invest. Uh, because the way that I see it, and we can talk more about it a little bit later as well, but the way I see it is that right now the market is on a discount, right? So for example, if it was 1975 and I'm here and the market's all the way down here, historically speaking, based on historical data, I know that the stock market will go back up and recover and do much more. So I will be buying on the way down, knowing that, hey, you know, in like 10 years of a good you know, idea, it's going to go back up and it continue going up, right? Especially if you're thinking about long-term investments and you're thinking about retirement, right? Because you're investing here and you're cashing out like here and you're going to be much higher. But if you decide to cash out here at this very bottom of the trough, you know, you're not going to come back in at the right time. You might come back in here, but you'd be missing out on all these returns in the middle, right? So that's something to keep in mind when it comes to recession and selling your investments, um, which we will talk more about as well. Uh, but at some point, generally speaking, the stock market does recover from a recession. We will see a dip. All right, let's talk about bonds. All right, so bonds and stocks have a very interesting relationship. For those of you who don't know what bonds are, you can think of bonds as another form of investment. Um, and generally speaking, it's, it's lending money, right? You're lending, lending money to another entity, and they will pay you back over a period of time plus interest. I think of that as a bond. And because of how it's structured, it's a safer investment than a stock. Right? Bonds tend not to drop in value during a recession. This time, it's different. Uh, it, this time is different due to various reasons that we can talk about. But generally speaking, during a recession, it does not drop in value. So on, on this chart, we'll see two lines here. The blue line, which represents the S&P 500 or the stock market. 
and you'll see it dips at the appropriate times during 08, during, um, even during the early 2000s, during dot-com boom, uh, and during 2020, right? There are dips here and there to signify that, hey, you know, that's a recession happening. Uh, but you'll notice that for bonds, they are very steady in value, right? This is the pink line for the bonds, um, which I represented using a mutual fund of bonds. So think of it like a collection of bond investments to give us a good idea about uh, the total value of bonds uh, and the bond market in general. Now, sometimes it does decrease in value, but generally speaking, it's pretty steady. It's more like a flat line, if anything, that gradually goes up, right? So bonds are not a great way to build wealth, but they are a great way to, great way to sort of maintain your wealth, right? They're safe investments. When a recession happens, bonds don't plummet in value, like what you see here, right? They don't lose a third of their value. Uh, they might lose like a couple of percentages here and there, uh, but it's definitely not going to be 30%, right? Or whatever percent the stocks are losing. Um, and it's hugely important to consider them in your portfolio, especially as you get closer to retirement or you get to a point where you need your money, right? Retirement is one great example because everyone needs to retire and you don't want to be 65 and look at your portfolio and say, hey, we have a recession right now and I can't actually retire because my bond, my stocks have all dropped in value. So... A good example is that, you know, if the stock market loses 30% of its value, you only have 70% to retire on. And for most people, that means you can't retire because you're missing 30%. Because the whole reason you decided to retire at 30, 65, because you built your, your net worth over that time. But if you had a good chunk of your portfolio in bonds, then potentially you can sell your bonds instead, which have not lost as much value, still might have lost some value, but not as much. Right, maybe definitely not 30%. You could sell some of those bonds and wait out to see and wait for the stock market to recover. Because historically speaking, we know it recovers. Maybe it'll be one to two years uh, or three years, right? Whatever it may be, we can't time or predict the stock market. We just know historically speaking, it does go up. And once it does recover, you know, you'll be back on track to re continue retiring, right? The ability to sell your investments uh, such as bonds to retire is so much better than deciding, hey, I'm going to take my losses and sell my stocks at an all time, you know, low in the past like five years. In that case, you really are locking in your losses and you effectively can't retire at that point. Um, so that's why it's important to have bonds um, and understand that, hey, you know, when a recession happens, they're usually a safe investment. And the main reason for this is because investors see uh, bonds as one of the sort of guaranteed safe investments in a sense that when a recession happens, they know stocks are going to plummet in value. So they sell off their stocks and they move them over to bonds. And that's why bonds tend to sort of maintain their value over time. All right. So here's the big question, right? Are we in a recession? Um, and a lot of folks in the news are saying yes. Uh, a lot of folks are also saying no. In particular, government entities are saying no, right? So it's it's a little tricky. I know some of you may feel like you're in a recession. I think people who got laid off definitely feel like they're in a recession because they're been directly impacted by it. Um, and it's a little tricky. I would say it depends right now. Um, but officially and according to the government, uh, no, as of December 6th, 2022, when I checked today, the National Bureau of Economic Research has not declared a recession, right? Even though we've had two quarters of negative GDP growth, right? Um, and, you know, they're the ones reporting data here. So what we can tell that there's been two quarters of negative growth here um, for Q1 and Q2 for 2022. Um, but even with all that, they have not declared a recession, Right, uh, which might be a, a good thing in a sense because in Q3 we recovered and we're growing again. So it's it's a little tricky, right? But officially we're not in an economic recession. Um, and that also means a lot of things because it might determine how government reacts, it might determine how companies react. But we what we are seeing is that companies are tending to be more conservative with their money. 
right? So there's less hiring uh, and less layoffs, especially in high growth industries, right? So in other areas, maybe not so much. In other areas, they're still hiring. So I would say I'm conflicted about the answer to this, uh, but officially speaking, there is no recession right now. Now, what I'm not saying is that we don't have a recession, right? Uh, it's, it's coming, we just don't know when, but it hasn't been declared now, right? So even if we don't have a recession, probably going to happen in the in the next couple of years, right? Um, because that's how economic recessions work. Remember, the economy is cyclical. So we're always going to have recessions. Um, the question is not if there will be a recession. The question is when. Um, and we never know when. So all we can do is prepare for it, right? All right. So Luckily for us, the U.S. government does have a response to recessions, which is a great thing for us. Um, they have a lot of power, in a sense, to, to, you know, to manipulate that. Uh, but remember the, the formula for GDP. Um, I'm going to give examples for each of them. And generally speaking, what policy changes uh, that are done by both the government and also the Federal Reserve and other branches of the government as well to encourage economic growth. Now, there's a lot of things that go into this. Um, but high level, let's give, give you some ideas here and try to relate them to exactly how it impacts recessions and how we recover from them. So the big thing is consumption and government spending, right? We've seen this in 2020. Stimulus checks, uh, free money, right? Who doesn't love free money? When you get free money, you spend the money and the government grows, right? Which might explain our quick recovery. I'm not going to say that's good or bad because, you know, some might point to stimulus checks as a reason for our high inflation that we're seeing in the past year, right? Whether that's the direct cause of it or contributed to it, you know, it's possible. Uh, but it's one way to come back from recession, right? To basically spend more money um, and encourage growth. Because if you spend more money, both public and private uh, institutions will have more cash on hand and then they can hire more, right? So it's a sort of a cycle, right? That, that contributes to that. Um, and also public private investments to create more jobs, right? The more jobs you have, the more spending you can do. And that will lead to a recovery from the recession. Now, investments. The Federal Reserve is doing something very interesting here, right? Most Fe the Federal Reserve does have a lot of powers when it comes to um, avoiding recessions or, in some case, recovering from a recession. Um, and the big part here is that, you know, the Federal Reserve has a goal, right? One of, has a couple of goals, but one of their goals is to maintain low inflation and low unemployment rates, right? So recession, high unemployment rate doesn't really make sense of their goals, right? So they're gonna fight that as much as they can. So what they usually do is that they can reduce interest rates um, and have quantitative easing, right? So big words, really what it means is that they are allowing for easy money, right? They're basically filling the economy with a lot of money um, and allows for easy loans. Right, so if you have low interest rates, um, a good example is if you have low interest rates, your mortgage rates are low. So if your mortgage rates are low, it's easier to buy a home because your mortgage payments are lower. And when you buy a home, the economy grows, right? Uh, when business, if you want to start a small business, um, the easier it is to borrow money with low interest rates. You know, if your business succeeds, the economy grows, right? So there's a lot of ways that the Federal Reserve can implement prop policies to basically encourage growth. Right now, they're increasing interest rates to fight inflation, right? That's a whole different story, a whole different thing. Uh, definitely very different from fighting it in recession, which they probably don't think we have right now, but they've gone on record to say more or less that they're willing to put the economy into a recession to fight high inflation, right? So it's, it's a little tricky there, right? Um, in terms of like their goals seem to almost be uh, counterintuitive, uh, but, one might argue that, hey, you know, now we have more ammo in interest rates for fighting um, an actual recession if it occurs, even if they might have caused it themselves, right? So it's it's something that um, the U.S. government has is handling. Right? Now, exports another one, uh, modified trade policies. Uh, this one is a little more complicated. Uh, basically, it deals with politics from other nations. And as long as the U.S. can create new or modify existing trade agreements, um, we can basically export more goods from the U.S., which would create more jobs for that industry. But the TLDR from all of this is that 
The U.S. government is really good at recovering from recessions, and we've done it for more than hundreds of years. Um, now, if the U.S. government is so good at it, right, it doesn't mean we don't suffer, right? The entirety of the U.S. Uh, country, of the United States, is that they grow over time, right? They've done so, and they're very good at it. But unfortunately, we still have to suffer. Uh, in terms of job losses and all these other issues that might pop up when it comes to our investments losing a value. So how can we address that? Well, there's a couple things here, right? A big one is having a sufficient emergency fund, right? This is so important that a lot of folks don't have this, right? There's so much uh, media and so much uh, information stating that, hey, you know, most Americans can't, you know, um, can't survive or can't deal with a surprise $1,000 expense. Right, coming out of nowhere, $1,000 emergency. Um, is that true? Hard to say. Hopefully you're not in that boat, but if you are, I, it's a tough situation, uh, but it basically means you don't have an emergency fund. Right? And a sufficient emergency fund is so important because a job loss is common during a recession. Right? We've seen unemployment rates go up. When you have a job loss, you're going to be without income right? for who knows how long. It's hard to say depending on what industry is like. Um, and when that happens, the best thing to have is, you know, you still got to eat, you still got to pay rent and right? that money is not going to come out of nowhere. Of course, you'll still have unemployment, right? Uh, but it's might not be enough. So it's so important to have three to six months of living expenses and maybe even more depending on what your, uh, your job situation is like, right? Is your industry easy to find a job? Is it hard to find a job? How long does it take on average to find a job? All these questions will go into answering basically how much money you need to save, have saved away uh, for living expenses. I mean, third thing here is that a lot of folks who have emergency funds tend to um, save money in a normal savings account. Not a great idea. If you have a normal savings account, don't do that. Put your money into a high yield savings account. Um, and basically what this means is that, you know, your, your company is, well, your bank is giving you more money to save with them. Right. So there's a lot of good high yield savings accounts out there. Um, feel free to Google them um, and you can find or chat with me about it. And I can recommend some to you, uh, but definitely do your own research and figure out which one works for you. Uh, but it's a huge difference in terms of making 100, 300 times more interest uh, when it comes to how much money you, you, know, you could be making from month to month. And one last point here is that don't invest your emergency funds. I can't tell you how many people have asked me, Hey, Alan, I have an emergency fund here. Can I invest the money? Uh, well, you know, if you invest your money and that money loses 30% of value, you're going to have, you know, one less month of emergency expenses uh, if, you, if you lost that, right? So investing in emergency funds is not a good idea just because you might need that money more urgently, urgently than you would expect. And during a recession where you lose your job and the stock market crashes, it's not going to look good, right? So try to save your money in a more safe investment. All right, so this is a big one when it comes to investing, right? So I see this so much and it's such a such a tricky one because it's folks don't listen as much because this is why um, a stock market drops in value in the first place. Um, so the big thing here is that don't sell and buy more index funds, right? Someone alluded to this as well in the chat, uh, but panic selling leads to losses, right? It's better to wait for recovery. Um, well, what happens a lot is that when folks see the stock market drop 10% of value, they're like, oh, I lost 10% of my money. Better sell and cut my losses and get out of here. Right? If more people sell, then it goes to 20%. Then it goes to 30% until it bottoms up at some point. We don't know where it'll bottom up, but it will eventually bottom out. Right? So with this in mind, if you panic sell, you're basically locking your losses. Right? If you decide not to sell, though, then potentially you'll recover your money and have it grow some more, especially if you are in a broad market index funds, right? Such as the S&P 500. If you're not, it's a little different, right? When it comes to your investments, uh, you might be in a dying industry, you, but that might not recover from a recession, uh, but it's up to you to determine where, uh, where your investments are. Now the market is unpredictable, right? We don't know when the recovery has started until after the fact, right? Some might argue, hey, we might be in a recovery right now. Hard to say, right? Uh, but also, I think it's important to sort of zoom out, right? Take a look at the market and the stock market um, over a 100-year period versus just the past six months where it hasn't been doing so well. 
Uh, last thing here is that long term, the stock market trends upwards, right? So you think of recession in the bear markets as discounts. And right? remember, if you buy low, you sell high. Don't buy high, sell low. If you sell during a recession and you panic selling, that's buy high, sell low. It's not a good idea, right? You really want to figure out long term investments. So I pulled this today and I'm looking at investments so far this year. Not great. We are down 17.8%. If you have money at SP 500, um, I mean, you know, the short of it is don't look at your 401k because if you look at it, you might be tempted to sell. Uh, try not to do that. Uh, and it's hard, right? It's, it's hard not to want to get out, especially, you know, knowing that you could drop so much more. Um, or you could be, we, we could be recovering, right? We're definitely not at the lowest point because the lowest point was uh, 3.4K. You can see there in the 52 week low. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we're recovering, right? It's hard to say when that's happening. So it's unpredictable. But here, you know, let me give you some uh, historical data. Historically speaking, over this entire period, this is the chart we saw before, we trend upwards, right? So we're just looking at a little, a little snapshot here, which is, you know, you're not going to see much from it, but you have to think about long-term goals, right? If you sell, you're losing your money, right? You're basically cashing out when in reality you should be, you know, buying more, saving more, if you can afford to buy more, right? Um, and try to... Uh, you know, hedge your bets for the long term because historically speaking, the stock market does recover and grow some more. Another point here is it's important to stay calm, right? I think during a recession, people panic a lot and, you know, the headlines don't help because, I mean, we're not in a recession right now and the headlines don't help. I feel like every day we're seeing something negative that's happening in the economy for various reasons, whether it's inflation or whether it's, higher interest rates, right? Or the stock market dropping again, right? So it's important to keep in mind that, you know, you want to stay calm, you want to take as objective as possible, an objective objective look at this. Um, and just remember that, you know, the layoff happens, it's not your fault, right? Take your time to recover and look for a new job. That's why it's key to have an emergency fund because you want to, you know, really take that time to recover and to really avoid selling your investments is the biggest thing um, when it comes to this and find a new job. Um, the next thing here is that, you know, don't let your short-term returns cloud your long-term financial goals, right? Stick to the plan. If your plan was to retire at 65 um, or to buy a house in 10 years, right? Or five years, right? Keep investing. Now, if you decide that, you know, you're going to sell right now and change your, all your goals altogether just because of a recession, um, knowing that it's transitive, right? It's not going to be long-term. It's not going to stay forever. Um, it's really going to mess up your, um, your financial planning. Right, so it's important to have long-term financial goals in place so that when a recession happens, you're like, hey, not a big deal. It's going to be tough for the next uh, year or two, but you, you know you're going to be in a better place with that with your long-term financial goals in place. The next one is talk to someone. Right, I think that a lot of folks who panic sell or a lot of folks who make poor financial decisions are because they don't talk to anyone. Right, You want to leverage your network, you know, your family, your um your coworkers, your friends, right? And just figure, hey, you know, what are you doing right? during this tough time? Um, and I really understand, you know, the best path forward when it comes to your own financial goals. Right? If you don't have anyone to talk to or if money is hard to talk to with people, because, you know, that's that's definitely a big thing. You know, feel free to talk to me. I'm always happy to, uh, to chat, um, which brings me to my next point about financial literacy coaching. Um, so this is sort of a free 30 minute one-on-one -on -one session with me to talk about your financial situation and answer your questions. You can choose however much information you want to share with me. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to chat as many times as you want. Definitely not going to turn into a paid session, right? The only limitation here is to find a session and find time on my calendar. Um, and I'm, then I'm happy to walk you through anything that you might have questions about and just to chat through it. Um, and I can paste the link in the chat as well. I mean, but you can see that the eighth is completely booked. So, you know, you have to go for 15 and 22 and so on. Uh, but the general gist of it is that I just want to do my best to help folks, especially folks who don't want to, um, you know, put their uh, their financials out in the public and just talk about them here. I think it's a good opportunity to um, chat and chat through uh, what's the best next move for you financially. Uh, and you know what, Alan, I'm also going to paste in the chat the link to your YouTube channel as well. Yeah. 
Thank you for that. You want to check that out as well. I'm subscribed. I encourage everyone else to subscribe. As well. <laughs> Oh, well, it's great to hear. And I can walk uh, some folks through the YouTube channel a little bit as well. Uh, so the five key things to take away from this uh, presentation of anything is that you know, the US economy is cyclical, right? So recessions will happen. It's, it's always gonna happen. It's always gonna be there. The best we can do is prepare for them. During a recession, stocks perform poorly and bonds are safer, right? So with that in mind, before recession happens, long-term you wanna have a goal in mind for how your investments should shake out, how you should perform your allocations, and so on, right? Uh, but it's expected that these two things are more or less true to a certain extent. Now, you want to avoid selling SP 500 broad market index funds, right? And hope for recovery because, as we've seen, the US stock market does recover over time. You don't want to sell at the very bottom. The US government is equipped to handle recessions, right? They dealt with it over hundreds of years. It's gonna happen, they know how to handle it, but there's going to be side effects. And unfortunately, we're gonna feel them. So as long as we're prepared for them, such as saving for an emergency fund for three to six months, a minimum, then we should be fine, right? It's all about how we can be proactive about preparing for a recession. All right, uh, it's, we're coming up towards the end, uh, but definitely if you have more questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I'm gonna paste that in the chat as well. Uh, but also, Greg, put my YouTube channel on there. Uh, so definitely reach out if you have questions. Uh, we will have more workshops in 2023. We don't know what those workshops are yet, but if you have ideas, if you're interested in recommending ideas, feel free to uh, send Greg an email, send me an email, and we can walk through it. Um, but just to walk some folks through the YouTube channel. So, you know, here I'm talking about the stock market is burning. So this is like, this is this presentation, just in more YouTube format, if you're curious about that. Uh, I know some folks you tend to ask me, hey, you know, what do you invest in? Uh, let's see here. So I do talk about what I put my money in. So there's going to be topics that I don't have time to touch upon in these workshops, but definitely are littered throughout my YouTube channel. So feel free to check that out. Um, but, you know, my goal is to get to 100 subscribers at the end of this year, and I beat that. So now I need a new goal before the end of the year. So if you can get me to 200, that'd be great. But if not, that's cool too, you know? No pressure. Aim high, Alan. <laughs> Aim high. No pressure. Uh, share with your friends and family. Um, I think it's important that people are financially educated. And as long as I'm able to, I conti will continue to volunteer my time <laughs> for this. Got a couple of good comments here. Remember us when you're big on YouTube, Alan. Yes, please I'll, remember us. I'll definitely, I definitely will. <laughs> We got another question here from Victor. How long do you think the recession will last? That's a great question. So recessions tend to vary in length and time. Um, but I think the recession and how long it will last is an uh, interesting point because it doesn't necessarily impact us directly um, in the sense that that's not the metric usually folks look for. The metric that folks look for is, you know, when does the employment recover uh, or when does the stock market uh, recover? because right? those are real world metrics that will impact us directly and they vary unfortunately uh unfortunately there's not a clear answer um as you'll see in unemployment what we have here you know for the weight recession it took what is it like eight years to recover get us back to where we were before eight seven eight nine years seven years roughly um and in 2020 obviously you know we got back in a year or two so it does vary depending on the cause of the recession, right? Which we don't know until after the fact. Um, and hard to say we actually know for, for, for sure, right? It may have contributed to it, but to gather all the facts or all the root causes is a little more complicated given the fact that we're in a global economy now. We got some good questions coming in now, Alan. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, what do we have here? Uh, is real estate a good investment today? Um, great question. So I recently is, I am invested in real estate. I bought a condo in 2021. I am one of the lucky few who bought what interest rates were low. Uh, my interest rate for full transparency is 3.25%, right? A lot of folks bought even lower at like the 2.75% area. Um, but now we are looking at six, 7%. Uh, let's see here, 30 year mortgage interest rates. What are we looking at here? 
Uh, that's, uh, here we go. We are looking at, oh, that's high. Uh, <laughs> we're looking at like 7.3%. Um, and that's high. Uh, so what that means that mortgage payments are so much higher, right? So if you're thinking about real estate as an investment, I would say, you know, if you're thinking about going with some kind of house hacking, right, is what we call it um, in real estate, you want to do the math and make sure your math is correct. Um, not all real estate investments are created equal. Unfortunately, it's like a house to house basis versus, uh, hey, you know, I could just select a mutual fund stock or something like that. Uh, so it's very important to do your own research and figure out if, you know, is the mortgage payment worth it? Like, are your tenants going to cover the payment? Um, or not, right? Some folks always say you can always refinance. It depends, right? Uh, you have to pay a lot upfront right now though. So it really depends on where your real estate is and if you have enough money to pay that mortgage right now, right? Some folks are seeing house prices drop. Of, of course, not across every neighborhood and every city or town, but some areas are dropping. So maybe it's worth taking a look at those areas to see if there's a good deal there. Uh, but I would say right now it's very expensive to go into real estate. Prices are still relatively high compared to a few few years ago, and interest rates are also high. So you're like you're paying a lot for real estate right now. Which industry or sector have better resistance to recession? That's a great question. Uh, I looked this up previously, but I think let me look this up again. Uh, industries that are recession proof. Yeah, people love to look us up. Um, and I, you know, I'm doing this live just because other folks can learn how to Google because you know the tricky part is knowing what terms to Google, right? Um, Investopedia is a great resource. Uh, reject all. Investopedia is a great resource for going over some of these um, just knowledge and topics. Uh, let's see here. What? And you know, some good ones are defense investments or utilities. Yeah. So basically, it's it's items or goods that have a, sort of, what is it called? Inflexible demand uh, in the sense that no matter what happens, whether you uh, it, the economy is not doing well or, do, or are doing well, you still need water and heat. You still got to eat and you still got to stay warm, right? So that's always going to be there. Um, so examples of businesses like that, that have demand no matter what is a good one. Uh, personal storage, interesting. Never thought about that, but definitely seems to be a case. Uh, you know, folks want to keep their stuff safe. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I think that's the most important line here. Um, so, although they do well during a recession, it may not indicate that they will continue to do well when the economy recovers. Um, so, it's important to keep in mind that the U.S. economy mostly recovers and does well over time versus being in a recession all the time. And that'll be horrible for us. Um, so keep that in mind as you think about um, industries and sectors that are have better resistance to recessions. How many months do you think the Fed will keep raising interest rates? Oh, that's the million dollar question. Um, I can tell you right now, based on current news, the Federal Reserve has signaled that they will reduce the amount of interest rates that they're increasing rates. So I think it's going down to 0.5 maybe. Hopefully, the next time they're going to raise it. But then we had a strong jobs report, which indicates that interest rates need to continue to be increased. Right, the whole point of increasing interest rates is to taper inflation, right, or to reduce inflation. And to do so, we need to slow down economic growth. I know it sounds bad saying that, considering that we are trying to avoid a recession or talking about handling a recession. Uh, but it's hard to say. The Federal Reserve will keep raising interest rates until inflation rate inflation rate is back down to around two percent, right? So unfortunately, for the foreseeable future, the answer is they will keep raising in, in interest rates, and we'll have to uh, be reactive to that. In addition to tech, do you think I got ads? Uh, let's see here. In addition to tech, do you think there are other fields more vulnerable to recession? Um, Good question. I think any field where there's a dependence on heavy consumerism is going to be vulnerable. Um, just because think about a sense that when a recession happens, you lose your job. When you lose your job, you can't spend money. So if you have goods and services that are in excess, 
uh, that you would spend excess money on, you know, they're probably not going to do well, right? Maybe a good example is any vacation or tourism industries. Right? You're not going to go on a vacation if you don't have a job. Right? Well, you shouldn't go on a vacation if you don't have a job, right? So that's another example, um, but they might react to it differently, right? So definitely any uh, any fields or industries that have seen high growth and seem to be over leveraged, right? They have a lot of debt um, or they grow way too fast. That's unsustainable, right? Those are good examples of areas that will suffer during a recession. Um, are raising interest rates affect the poor people the most since essentially it's stopping consumption to so less jobs for them? Uh, it's it's interesting um, perspective. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily true because, you know, like we mentioned, uh, the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates, but there are more jobs uh, being created <laughs> and more people being hired, according to our data. Um, so I don't, I don't think that's necessarily true of uh, a statement. Um, I think there's a lot more, there's more complicated factors at play there. Uh, but what is true is that unfortunately recessions disproportionately impact those or, that are low of lower income, right? Because if you're low income, you generally don't have uh, an emergency fund. And when you lose your job, you're basically restarting every five to 10 years, right? You don't have an opportunity to grow your wealth. Um, it's very different from someone who graduated college, who are in a high earning profession or even average earning profession. Um, you're able to save an emergency fund. You're able to continue investing during a recession, right? If you're smart about it um, and build wealth, right? You're basically able to um, exponentially grow your wealth um, and use recessions as sort of a, a wealth building and wealth generating event. Because, uh, you know, the stock market goes back up. So if you buy now when it's low, it's going to go back up. Um, historically speaking, but that might not be true for, for a lot of folks who can't afford to, to do that, right? So they're just basically restarting. People on fixed incomes are hit hard during recession, like the ones with, uh, yeah, rising costs. You know, if your income is not, your income is never going to grow at the pace of uh, inflation for, for various reasons, because if they did, you would have something called hyperinflation happening, right? Uh, if companies increase your income every time prices would go up, it would just be a cycle, right? It would be like, you know, increase over, you try to one up each other, and that's that's bad. Um, but yes, people who have fixed incomes are going to suffer uh, heavily during a recession. Um, and whenever inflation happens, right? Even though we have high inflation now, but not necessarily a recession, right? So it's it's a tricky set of factors. Of all the prices are going up because of inflation, um, will they go down once everything is uh, is more normal? Um, yeah, I mean, by definition, inflation is prices going up, um, and more normal, uh, a little, little tough, right? <laughs> a little tough to, uh, to explain what that means. Um, let's see, I think that, um, uh, if you go over my video about stock market is burning, I do talk about inflation and possible causes of it. Uh, but there's a lot of things that lead to the cause of it. The biggest ones are... I mean, I don't want to say the biggest ones, but some causes of it are we are having supply chain issues globally, right? Um, the COVID shutdowns are a good example of this in China, right? We depend on China so much for manufacturing our goods. And because there aren't enough goods to meet demand, then companies will have to raise prices, right? So in line with that, there's also issues with the Ukraine-Russian war that we're seeing. And there's gas increases because Russia apparently has a lot of oil from the world, right? And if they decide not to ship it out or they decide not to sell it um, or decide to increase the prices, right? Um, which is res restricts supply, right? That also increases um, the cost of goods. So there's a lot of reasons for high inflation. Unfortunately, uh, they're not all, none, none of them are easy, easy solves, right? All of them are very complicated. So all the Federal Reserve can do is, hey, if we sign inflation, all we can do is say, hey, we want to lower demand, um, which in theory would lower inflation. And the way they're doing that is unfortunately increasing interest rates, which has the side effect of reducing economic growth, which is the whole, the whole goal in the first place. 
did the Russian Ukraine conflict cause the current economic situation to accelerate downwards? Um, I can't tell you for sure. I can tell you that it's contributed to it. Definitely contributed to it for sure. Uh, there's definitely, you know, war is tricky when it comes to economics. Uh, some might argue that war, you know, the world wars, for example, pulled us out of a recession and uh, economic decline. Uh, but that's not necessarily true across the board, right? Sometimes in this case, it's causing us great pain in many ways, right? But economic, um, from an economic standpoint, we're definitely seeing issues there. Because I'm not saying that if the, if the conflict were to stop tomorrow, things would be better. It's one cause, right? There could be a multitude of causes. This is why I meant by we only know the causes when we look backward on it, right? Um, and really an analyze everything. And even then, it's, you know, you should have shooting in the dark because the economy is so complicated now when we talk about the global economy. Any other, uh, any other questions? Thank you very much, Alan. Are there any other questions before we wrap up? Fantastic. Well, I want to thank everybody who tuned in for this, uh, this webinar this evening. I'm going to paste in one more time the, uh, the link to Alan's YouTube. Uh, and I know Alan also had his uh, link for uh, scheduling a financial literacy session with him uh, previously in the chat. Feel free to do that. Uh, we really appreciate Alan being so gracious enough with his time to, uh, to make that available for people. Uh, and thank you again uh, for joining us. I hope to see you all at some more alumni events in the near future. Uh, and as Alan mentioned, we will be doing more webinars next, uh, next year. Uh, and if you have any ideas for topics that you would like to see us cover or something that we haven't done yet, uh, definitely reach out to us and, and provide your suggestion because we're open to a lot of different topics. We've already got a, a handful we've been, uh, we've been batting around, but any additional topics to, uh, would be great for us to think about. So please send those our way if you have anything you'd like us to cover. And uh, thank you again for joining us, everyone. Hope you all have a great holiday season coming up. And oh, send your suggestions to me or to Alan directly through email. Um, you can respond to the email that we send out uh, following up after this event, uh, which will have my email and Alan's. You can also, I'll put in my email in the chat here. Uh, you can email me right there at that address. And uh, looking forward to seeing some suggestions and ideas that anyone might have. Uh, hope you all have a great holiday season coming up. And uh, I hope you're all, uh, you're all have a healthy and wealthy, uh, wealthy new year. And Alan, do you have any final words you'd like to leave us with? Yeah, um, just echo what you've been saying. You know, definitely reach out. If, um, if you have ideas, if you want to chat more of me, always happy to chat. Um, and I'm wishing everyone happy holidays, and I'll see you next year. Thanks for Take coming. Care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your evening. Take care. Bye.